my goodness. I didn't know I was going to cry. It takes a lot. I am so grateful for the relationship. And for all of us that are in the ministry, to see other ministries who reflect your, your ideas of what church should be like and getting away from law uh, into grace and to see people thrive is really encouraging because it doesn't happen everywhere. What you guys have here, you need to value. You need, you need to treasure. We're celebrating 10 years. That's twice as long as the average church in America. Do you know why? Let me tell you. It's really hard. No, no, no. It's really hard. The guy who wrote, it's easy like Sunday morning, was not in the ministry. <laughs> Quite honestly, ministry would be easy if it wasn't for three things. Write it down, put it on your refrigerator. Ministry would be easy if it wasn't for people. Because <laughs> the guy who said people are crazy is me. People are crazy. Ministry would be easy if it wasn't for the devil. And ministry would be easy if it wasn't for the devil and people. <laughs> ministry is really, really tough. And I want to qu give you a question. And I want you to just contemplate it for a second. Why do we celebrate? And what is it we're actually celebrating? Somebody said it earlier, we're not actually celebrating the day. This is 10 years, but we're not celebrating this day. We're not actually celebrating an event, 10 years. What we're actually celebrating is what it took you to get here. You know, they don't give ribbons at the start of a race. They, they give you the victory at the end of the race because nobody cares how you start. What matters is how you end. And so I, I want to give you a thought. I want to challenge you today. It's real simplistic, but I think the body of Christ has missed it at large. And that's the need to celebrate so that you can get through the tough times. I'm going to show you a principle. You've got it on your refrigerators. You have it in pictures. You have it in songs. But I have found the body of Christ does not actually live it very well. I have found two things that Christians don't do well at all. We don't grieve well, and we don't celebrate well. Can I, without feeling like I'm throwing you under the bus... Every time somebody has said, we need to celebrate 10 years, the response was pitiful. Because we don't know how to celebrate. The world knows how to celebrate. That's why they're drawing people. They're full of joy. They, they're, they're enjoying their life, and Christians look like prunes. And we can't figure out why people don't want to come to the church. It's hard work. It took a lot to get here. See, we have a job as ministry, and as Christians, and pastors, and leaders that the secular world doesn't even know they face. We face it on a high level. We not only face the problems of just people being crazy, we face a real devil who is trying to take you out on every front. Have you ever thought about why we celebrate an anniversary? You, what you're really celebrating is that you didn't kill each other. I mean, I'm really surprised there aren't more murders and marriages than there are. Because we, we take somebody who's an early-to-bed person and put him with a night owl. We put him with someone who loves a fan on the other one, wants no fan whatsoever. We put someone who wants lights on all the time and someone who always wants it dark. We, we, put it, we, put, we, we, we put people together who one drives from the driver's seat and the other one drives from the pa passenger, passenger seat. That's why we celebrate. We made it. We, we got through the hard stuff. Ministry is hard. People who said they were going to be with us forever, people who were Hosanna, Hosanna, one day were crucified, crucified, are no longer with us. It's painful. You build people up and you pour into people. And I've done this so many times, taking somebody that most churches wouldn't even look at twice. They're on drugs. They've lost their marriage. They've lost their kids. They've lost their job. They've lost their home. Bring them to Christ, get them spirit-filled, get them delivered, get them a job. Their wife comes back, their kids come back, they get their job back, and then they quit and go down to the church, down the street. That's hard to take. That's hard. That's why we celebrate, and that's why we need to celebrate. Let me give you some examples. Well, let me, let me talk about you kids for a second. Why do you celebrate 
your kids graduating. Yeah, you're right, that you didn't kill them. They, they made it. I understand why some animals eat their young. I, the spirit of the spiders come only a couple times. It's like, I brought you in, I'll take you out. When you look through the, through the gospel, there are some stories that are written that we need to grab a hold of. Pastor Moses got this. Pastor Moses is taking these millions of people out. He's anointed by God. And all the people do is complain. Sounds like the church to me. Anybody who's in ministry gets this. It's either too loud or not loud enough. It's too cold or it's not cold enough. Why do we have these instead of these kind of chairs? Why, do we, why don't we ever do this anymore? It's just, there's nothing. You're like an umpire in a game. Every decision you make, half the team is mad at you. And Pastor Moses is leading these people out, and they're murmuring and complaining again. And Pastor Moses says, Lord, these are not my children. <laughs> That's pretty interesting to me. These are not, I didn't bring these people into this world. I'd get it. I, I could handle that if these were mine, because I don't have any choice. These are not mine. He says, I didn't, I didn't bring them in. He says, if you're, if you're going to treat me like this, because this is not what I signed up for. Is there anybody besides me got in the ministry thinking it was going to be one thing only to find out it wasn't exactly what you thought it was? I found out pretty, all, pretty early on in ministry, sheep bite. <laughs> really hard. And Pastor Moses said, I didn't bring these people into this world. He said, if this is the way it's going to be, just kill me now. That's a bad hair day. I've been there. I've been there. But that's why we, because ministry is hard. <laughs> the Apostle Paul talking about all the trials that he's been through. Man, I've been in jail all this time. I've been naked. I've been starving. I've been mistreated by these people and mistreated by these people. I've been in the water a night and a day. I've been in a shipwreck. I've been beat five times with rods. I've been all, and he says, and not to mention the care of the church. <laughs> See, that's exactly what I thought. He put on all those hard things, taking care of people, because it's hard. Have, have you come to the conclusion yet that relationships are difficult? One guy said, having a marriage and a relationship that works is like nailing jello to the wall. <laughs> I kind of think, think he was right. Relationships are hard. Not not because we intend them to be. We're different. And we endeavor to keep what the Lord has given us. Ephesians 4. We endeavor to keep the unity that God has placed on us. And let me just tell you what I have, I have found. We don't grieve well. For those of you who have lost someone or gone through grief, the world, the church, we give you about four weeks. And then we want you back at your job. And we want you smiling. We don't want you crying. C.S. Lewis said when he lost his wife, he said, I didn't know losing my wife would make me an embarrassment. And what he was saying is because he would cry, it made people feel uncomfortable. So we don't grieve well. People want you to get over it, but it's for their sake, not yours. They don't know how to handle. We don't handle grief well. But we don't handle celebration well either. Have you ever thought, we, we call it church, it's called Sabbath earlier on. We should still should look at it as the Sabbath day. God put Sabbath rhythms in our life so we would at least rejoice one day out of an entire week. Sabbath was about rejoicing, remembering what you've been delivered for, looking at all that God has done in your life and being grateful. It was about being filled up so that you could be poured out. And he put 52 of those a year for us. And then we look at the seven feasts. And if you add an anniversary and a few kids' birthdays, it doesn't take very long at all. You've got like 70 celebrations in your calendar if you do it right, and we don't. Can I tell you, I've watched the body of Christ over and over again have a, come through a hard time. I've watched individuals come through difficulties, really hard, things, and they're believing God. And God supernaturally came through. And instead of actually enjoying it and rejoicing, they are already worried about what's going to happen next week. 
Let me give you some scriptures that are real familiar to you, but I, I, I pray that they wouldn't just be something put on your refrigerator or on a picture frame, but that you would begin to experience the power of what they were meant to do for you and I. I have found in John 5, 39, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have salvation. But they speak of me, but you wouldn't come to me. And I found there are a lot of people who can quote me scriptures while they're betraying the scriptures while they're quoting them. Now, I don't want to offend anybody. Please hear my heart. I, but I do want to challenge. I had an individual that I was going to pray for. He was sick. And I went to go pray for him. And he's quoting me the scripture. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. While I'm having to talk through him through a window pane while he had a mask on and a shield and washing his hands with sanitizer. And he's quoting to me, God didn't give me a spirit of fear. We have people who quote the love of God. I know the love of God. The whole time telling me, if God loved me, why did this happen? So it's not enough for us to know scriptures. We actually have to know the God of the scriptures. And what I want to share with you right now, and it's a real simple truth, but I think we're terrible at understanding the power of joy in our life. There are all kinds of scriptures. You can finish them for me. The joy of the Lord is our... Do you believe that? See, it's important that we don't just quote it, but we actually believe it. I have watched in so many marriages, they're struggling. They come in for counseling. And so I will ask them, when's the last time you went out and enjoyed each other's company? And they have to think about it. I'm like, I think I know the problem. I think I know what, at least part of the problem. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Many of you have no idea the things my wife and I have been through. My wife, Ginger, is here with me. We have been through some really difficult, hard things. But we have a great marriage, and we still love one another because we still have joy in our marriage. We still go out on dates and enjoy each other's company. It's been a while now, but we, we live in, in Oklahoma. It gets hot there. And we were going to eat one evening, and it was like 95 degrees, and it's 8 o'clock at night. It's dark. And we're driving the back way so we can just take our time and talk. And I stop, and I see the sign that says, watch for ice. <laughs> so I stopped. And she was looking on her phone, I don't know, trying to figure out reservation or something. She finally realizes we're stopped. She says, what are you doing? I said, the sign says to watch for ice. Bam, she hit me in the arm. We're going to be late. Get going. We still enjoy each other's fellowship, and marriages are crumbling because they forgot why they got married. They forgot to enjoy each other, and they got wrapped up in all the bills and the kids and all these things. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If you have joy, I know lots of people who I'm connected to who have joy in their marriage relationship, and they can go through the horrible thing and come out on the, better, on the other side better. But I've watched marriages who don't have joy in their marriage, and they're arguing over the toothpaste. I mean, knock down drag outs over the toothpaste. He, he squeezes it, and she rolls it. And they have, they have knocked down drag outs over the tooth. I'm like, buy two tubes till I can help you. It's, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. Let me share with you a principle. Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Seth said it, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. You know, joy was meant to be something that was participated in your life, and celebrating was supposed to be something in your life to help you get through the difficult times. And part of the reason the body of Christ is failing and falling is because we don't know how to enjoy the life God has given us. We don't know how to truly celebrate the things that God wants us to celebrate. We've made it 10 years. We need to celebrate. Amen. I mean, really celebrate. I watch people celebrate better over a pigskin going over a line. It's... It shouldn't be like that. 
Jesus is giving us a principle that we need to grab a hold of. That joy is our strength. And if we have joy, that joy helps us get through the hard things in life, the hard things in our marriage, the hard things in our business, the hard things in our church, the hard things in ministry. Now, these are familiar scriptures, but I want you to look at them in the light of how joy was supposed to be a part of our Christian life to give us what we needed to to overcome all the attacks and all the things that we go through. In Proverbs 17, 22, it says, joy doeth good like a medicine. You know, I know some Christians, they need intravenously fed joy because they haven't laughed and haven't had joy in so many years. They're just going to have to force feed it in them. It's, it's terrible. I've gone to some churches, and when people started laughing, it, it was almost instantly shut down. It's like, this is the church. We're, we're, we're supposed to be sober-minded. No, you're just sober. You need to be drunk in the spirit. You might be more fun to hang around. <laughs> right? <laughs> so let me just, even in that, when do you take medicine? Do you take medicine when you're healthy? No, you take medicine when you're sick. But the enemy will try to talk you and out of our joy when we're going through something hard, when we actually need the joy the most. When things are difficult, listen, I've lost family. I've lost family. And this year, I have buried more of my friends than any other time in the ministry. And I've been in the ministry 42 years plus. It's been difficult. But part of what gets me through that is I know this life is temporal. If you, <laughs> we, we need to wake up. I, I talk to people all the time. We, we all have an expiration date, beloved. I'm involved in a, in a generation now that somehow thinks we're not going to die. We all have an expiration date. That's why that should help us to live life better. It should help us to enjoy the life we've been given. And I got Christians all over the country going, I'm, I'm believing for 120 years. Okay, do you know anybody that made it? Somewhere between here and 120 years, we're going to meet our maker. But part of the way you get through it is the joy of the Lord that's not the same as fun. Joy is a gift of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Joy is what helps us get through. Joy is what gives us the endurance to get through. And we're just not good at it. I, 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 don't, I don't even know why that is. I, I just don't know. We don't... Have you ever been with family and friends and you laugh so hard your stomach hurt? Did you ever walk away from there going, God, I never want to do that again. That was terrible. <laughs> of course not. Why is that? Because the scripture is true. When you enjoy, I was with Seth and some others last night for a little bit of time, and we laughed. When you laugh, something happens on the inside of you that makes you feel good. It gives you strength. It builds you up. And the enemy has desperately tried to take that from the body of Christ. And I encourage you to go back through the Bible and look at every scripture in which the word joy joyful, rejoicing, cheerful, all those things are mentioned, you will be blown away at how many times the Lord has tried to help us see joy is needed. Let me, let me get you to write something down in your notes. If you're not taking notes, write this down. Joy is necessary and needed. So I'm going to be short-winded because blessed are the short-winded, they'll be asked back. <laughs> So let me just close with this thought. Find what brings joy in your life and make it a part of your daily existence, your weekly existence, your monthly existence, and your existence, period. I I know because, and this is, I don't want to tell you how many funerals I've done, but the one thing about doing funerals has caused me to understand we all have an expiration date and I, I need to live life differently. And I love family, the church family and my natural family. And nobody goes to their grave saying, I wish I'd have spent more time at the office. 
what we regret is not spending time with our friends. So I have found the things that bring joy to me. My family brings joy to me. My wife and I just drove one hour down to see our grandkids. She talked to me for about three minutes, and then we drove back another hour. But those three minutes were worth the two-hour drive. She was sharing with me this thing that was going on, and she was hurt. She wanted me to pray, and I was always grateful when my grandkids want me to pray. But that three minutes brought me so much joy, it was worth the hour drive and the hour drive back. Find what brings you joy and make it a part of your life. Don't let the enemy talk you out of things. Don't let the enemy cause you to be so busy you forget to do the things that are important, like laugh. Can I speak to the Gen Zs and the millennials for just a second? Please don't exchange an LOL for an actual laugh. They're not the same thing. They are not the same thing. I, I like the person who laughs and snorts when they laugh. Because <laughs> it's real. Nobody would laugh like that if they could stop it. It's just, it's just real. So I will close with this thought. Y'all just laughed. Did that make you feel good or bad? Joy doeth good like a medicine. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. I think we ought to rejoice at 10 years for an entire year, not just one afternoon. Amen. I'm done.